Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, just want to thank all of you uh, for joining us. We're going to have a great conversation uh, about a civilian Climate Corps proposal, which has a very good chance of uh, passing the United States Senate and House and being put on President Biden's desk if we just keep fighting. Uh, and if we do that, we can ensure that jobs and justice are at the heart of that program. Uh, and we, by the way, we're making progress. We're not really near the, the finish line yet, uh, but we have a chance, a good chance to make progress on legislation that could change our country and the planet for a generation and more. And that work is not yet done and we wouldn't be half as far as we are without the tireless work of so many people on this call. And it's an honor to be with so many climate leaders, policy experts, and local core members from across Massachusetts who have been on the forefront of our movement to pass a civilian climate core. And I'd like to introduce Becca Ellison. Becca is the Deputy Policy Director at Evergreen, who has been instr instrumental in writing and crafting our legislation from the very snark start. Uh, Jasmine Nee, a Sunrise Boston Hub Coordinator, who has been on the front lines of the movement to pass a Civilian Climate Corps in our Commonwealth's capital. Um, Leslie Melendez, the Deputy Director of Groundwork Lawrence, a group that is doing incredible conservation and climate adaptation work across Massachusetts, Mary Mac Valley. Rafael uh, Cartagena, uh, Groundwork Lawrence's green team leader and a former green team member. Rafael is a perfect person to talk with us about how we can create not only jobs, but careers through our core program. And Nina Peppers, program manager at the Massachusetts Historic Preservation in Public Lands Corps, an AmeriCorps program that will serve as a model for the nation as we build out the Civilian Climate Corps. Uh, this past April, I was proud to stand alongside my friend, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to introduce a revolutionary twist on an old program, uh, the Civilian Climate Corps. Our Civilian Climate Corps would update and modernize and expand on the concept of the New Deal era, Civilian Conservation Corps, and this time ensure that justice and climate action is at the heart of every job created and every project which is completed. The CCC is all about livable wages with benefits, on-the-job training from local unions, sweat equity that builds racial, moral, and political equality, work that rebuilds the economy and saves the planet all at the same time. President Roosevelt's CCC mobilized millions of Americans, but it left far too many Americans on the outside looking in. Uh, we can honor the CCC's founding while acknowledging its imperfections and its flaws. This is our opportunity to reinvent, reimagine, and rebuild America with the Civilian Climate Corps. Massachusetts has a reputation as a revolutionary state, but we're already building a clean energy workforce revolution in the Bay State, and this is going to help to expand it uh, ever more. We're home, thank goodness, to a number of local core programs already working on climate adaptation and conservation strategies, and we're lucky that Massachusetts will yet again serve as a model for the rest of the nation. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about some of those programs today and how we can use our already existing local programs as a foundation to build a national scale CCC. So I'd love to hear from our guests. And again, I'd love to first introduce an incredible young activist, Jasmine Nee, uh, a hub coordinator for Sunrise Boston. Welcome, Jasmine. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Senator Markey. I'm so grateful to be here today. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm 17 years old. I'm a rising senior at Sharon High School in Sharon, Massachusetts on Wampanoag and Massachusetts land, as well as an organizer with the Boston Hub for Sunrise Movement. In this moment we're in right now, it's a scary thing to turn on the news. Almost without fail, we hear about yet another region of the country experiencing floods or fires or droughts or storms that put countless families and communities at risk. I'm a member of the generation that has to live with this climate crisis, a crisis that is the product of negligence from past generations and people in power who decided to turn a blind eye. I understand that the reality is my peers and I are not walking into a world or into a workforce that has the space nor the opportunities we need to adequately respond to this emergency. When you look up Sunrise, our website will tell you that we are a youth movement dedicated to stopping climate change and creating millions of good jobs in the process. The Civilian Climate Corps does just that. Not only does it create 1.5 million good paying and community serving jobs for young people like myself, it's also a promise that the world we're going to inherit will be safer, cleaner, more just, and more livable. We are seeing every day this growing need for big, bold, action-filled legislation, and the CCC is a key aspect of an infrastructure package that could fill that need. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation today about why we need a civilian climate corps. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. So thank you uh, for those uh, great words. And now I'd like to invite Nina Peppers, a project manager at the Massachusetts Historic Preservation and Public Lands to say a few words about her local core program. Yeah, thanks, Senator Markey. Uh, yeah, my name is Nina Peppers. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I'm here representing the Student Conservation Association. We are a national organization uh, and our mission is to build the next generation of conservation leaders and inspire lifelong stewardship of the environment and communities by engaging young people and hands-on mm -hmm. to the land. Uh, here in Massachusetts, we have two really amazing programs, both AmeriCorps programs. Um, one is the Massachusetts Conservation Corps, also known as MAC. Uh, they're based in the Western part of the state and they focus on conservation projects like trail maintenance, um, park accessibility, invasive species removal, and just like really taking care of the conservation and public lands that we have in Massachusetts. Um, the program that I run, the Historic Preservation Corps, um, we focus on structures and buildings and historic preservation. So also an AmeriCorps program. Um, you know, the saying is the greenest building is one that's already standing. Uh, and that's the work that we do. So our members do things like historic window restoration, mm. uh, which makes buildings more energy efficient uh, while also preserving that historic material. We also serve on the Boston Harbor Islands, making sure that those buildings remain standing uh, despite some of the climate change that is happening. Um, yeah, so both AmeriCorps programs, we're really excited to be a part of the conversation. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Thanks for your great work. And now I'd like to introduce Becca Ellison, the Deputy Policy Director at Evergreen, a group uh, which has been integral to the development of the Civilian Climate Corps. Welcome. Thank you so much, Senator, both for bringing together this group of folks and also for your incredible leadership on this program and on a host of other climate and clean energy priorities that we need to get through Congress this year. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here with this group of people talking about the Civilian Climate Corps. Um, this is a program that will channel the enthusiasm of young people and folks across the country to be able to serve their country, um, you know, earn a living wage, earn benefits, and gain the training that they need to succeed in the clean energy economy in good paying union jobs. Senator, as you've said before, we think this program could be really transformational for climate, for jobs, and for justice. You know, on climate, core members can help retrofit buildings, install clean energy programs, and help cities develop action plans so that they're ready. On jobs, you know, we will need a pipeline of workers who are prepared and ready to help build that clean energy economy. And this is a program that can help as I said, take young people, unemployed and underemployed folks from across the country and put them to work building the clean energy economy and on a pathway to good paying union jobs. And finally, on justice, 
for too long, black and brown communities, low income communities have been overburdened with toxic pollution after generations of racist policymaking and other structural inequities. And this program could help. The program we're fighting for would devote 50% of its investments to the environmental justice communities and also would recruit 50% of its members from those communities. So we're really thrilled, Senator, to be working with you and other members of Congress to make this program a reality alongside all of the needed climate and clean energy investments this year. So thank you so much. Beautiful, great job, thank you so much. And next up is my friend, Leslie uh, Melendez, the Deputy Director of Groundwork Lawrence, a group in the Merrimack Valley that will serve as an example of the type of climate core work that can be done in communities across the country. Welcome. Thank you, Senator, um, and thank you for having us and putting this um, roundtable together. Groundwork Lawrence has been doing this exact type of work for over 20 years now in the city of Lawrence um, and expanding the work to the um, surrounding cities and towns. But one of the things that we noticed very early on working with our youth was that it wasn't just enough to get them involved because of this, the home life and the situations that they were in. We had to do more. We had to value um, what they were doing and make sure that they were getting paid for the work that they were doing, right? Um, and so with our green team program, we're creating that pipeline that Becca had um, referred to in her opening remarks. We're creating a group of young people that are working hard to make sure that climate and justice are at the forefront of everything that we're doing through tree planting, through um, river cleanups, through um, their work as ambassadors in the community, getting the word out. So as part of that work, it is really important for us at the local level to make sure that we're supporting these programs um, at the federal level, because it will benefit everything that we're doing here um, and across the Commonwealth. And as you said, Senator, Massachusetts is always on that um, fast track of doing this work um, very early on and being that leader in the industry. So we are very happy to be here. Thank you for having us. No, uh, thank you so much for all your work. And uh, as you know, my, my father grew up on the first floor of a triple decker up in Lawrence. And I went up, you know, making that tour of all the great work you're doing up there to kind of restore the relationship uh, between Lawrence and uh, nature. And it's just incredible work. And it's work that we can scale dramatically if we pass a civilian climate court. It's just absolutely critical. The people think of this not just in terms of, uh, of uh, the traditional CCC of the 1930s uh, out in more rural America and out in the forest, but in this modern era in the cities as well. Uh, so that we're focusing upon those issues and bringing in civilian climate core members to partner and expand what you're already doing. So thank you for that great work. And, uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Rafael Cartagena. Uh, Groundwork Lawrence's green team leader and a former green team member himself. Raphael knows how integral these core programs can be to the career growth and development of young people in our communities. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you, uh, Senator, and hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I've been with green team for seven years now. My first, it was actually my first job as well, and it was a, a crazy, most amazing experience ever because of the excuse me, because of the fact that I was able to really learn more about the environment, learn more that Lawrence needs it. Lawrence needs to value its rivers, its sanctuaries where we can go to the parks. Because I, me as a kid, 14 years old, my first job, I didn't know much about Lawrence. I wasn't aware of the parks and how much they value and how much nature was important and interval in just the living of the city. So as a person that was able to do this for four years working at ground groundworks green team and learning and trying to put my best foot forward in creating better spaces for us green spaces it was really a big in my life and it, later on i volunteered many years after even after i graduated from high school and college and even now when i came back as a leader i saw the work that i have done and saw that there's still work to be done but yet that the work is there. There's so much that we've done, so much parts that look so much different than when I was a kid to now that has really dramatically changed how the green spaces are being used and how so many people are valuing now our nature, 
our rivers, how people are able to fish in the river, how people are able to enjoy the different birds that come by and really understand that these were things were here before us and these things will surpass us and we need to value them and we need to take care of them because that this is our world and this is where we want to start and want to keep going and cleaning and continuing to make better. So thank you um, so much and thanks for the incredible dedication uh, which you have to this program and to all the young people that you have helped to train over the years. Thank you so much for that. And again, you know, these programs uh, are really intended uh, to help young people, especially move into unions, uh, be able to use what they uh, are learning to, in order to further their education. So, uh, what our legislation calls for is $15 uh, an hour as a minimum that would have to be paid so that it would uh, be there. 50% uh, of the Civilian Climate Corps funds have to go to environmental justice communities and 50% of our core members uh, must come from those same communities, communities like Lawrence, but other historic uh, environmentally uh, justice challenge communities uh, in our country. Uh, but the, the legislation also calls for a, a, a big increase in and guarantee of, of health care and child care to support um, working families uh, who will be, uh, which will create an additional enticement for people to want to volunteer. Uh, and we also give in our legislation $25,000 a year uh, for student loan forgiveness or to pay tuition at public universities in our country uh, as an additional incentive. So not only would the workers uh, receive healthcare, childcare, minimum wage of $15, um, but also this incredible, if, People serve two years, $50,000 uh, educational package to help uh, young people to be able to pay back their student loans or to uh, be able to go to a public university of their choice. So um, why, if, 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 if people um, uh, on the call would respond, anyone can jump in, uh, how can we ensure that uh, a Civilian Climate Corps focuses on not only job creation, but career mobilization so that it's a long-term commitment that people are making. I'll jump in, Senator. I think one of the things that, you know, is very clear is that the, the living wage um, needs to be addressed uh, because we can't expect folks, and yes, they're in service to their country, but we can't expect them to be living um, below poverty levels, right? So we have to make sure that we're supporting them and working with them. And although $15 is amazing and it's, it's much more than what AmeriCorps members and um, Conservation Corps members are making now, you know, as we look at the work that we're doing, you know, we are paying our leaders and our tree um, crews 18 to $20 an hour um, to really be able to think about and see what, um, what that living wage looks like. We all know that in the state of Massachusetts, a living wage is much higher than that. But if we get to start somewhere where they can at least have a leg up, and we are giving them those opportunities. And then the opportunity to train in fields that aren't always traditionally um, open and welcome to individuals of color, to black and brown communities, right? To be able to have the access to those um, trainings that they wouldn't normally have access to because they don't know about them. They don't know they exist. They don't know they're out there, right? So making sure that we're having those conversations and that the training and um, the living wage is key to how we move this forward within, you know, within our own organizations and um, communities, but also across the country. What you're saying is that uh, we're going to have to recruit and we're going to build that funding into the legislation so that um, so that we'll have outreach into communities that traditionally haven't thought about these kinds of programs. So AmeriCorps uh, will be the foundational governmental uh, agency that will be responsible for the program. They're already doing uh, uh, work in this area. This is going to be 
uh, very much scaled um, uh, up in a very uh, dramatic way from what they're already doing, but it'll be the hub will be AmeriCorps and then all of the spokes uh, will then uh, be enlarged uh, and the programs enhanced by, uh, by the funding that we're going to put into this program. And we just have to make sure that we're reaching out into uh, communities that historically may not have had uh, an interest in or even knowledge about uh, this kind of a program. And, uh, and just, you know, right now, AmeriCorps only pays $7.50 an hour. Uh, and they don't have the benefits that we're talking about. So we're actually going to bring in all the AmeriCorps workers as well and give them all of these same benefits. How important do you think that will be? That's extremely important. And I think it's a very valuable outreach tool, right? If we're going out into our communities and talking about the opportunity to not only serve our communities and serve our country, but to do it in a way that they're making a living wage, that there were that they have health care, um, and that they have this educational benefit that is going to really give them that leg up and that opportunity. But we've got to think about that outreach in non-traditional ways. It has to happen on the ground. It has to be grassroots organizations doing this type of work um, and doing the outreach because your traditional posting on places like LinkedIn, Idealist, and things like that is great, but it's not where typically black and brown communities go to find opportunities. Exactly. And, 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 I'd, and I'd like to, again, contrast what the Civilian Climate Corps will be with um, President Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps. That focused principally upon conservation. And we're going to do that as well. But we, this has an expanded vision. It, it will look at clean energy, health, transportation, housing, food systems, uh, so that we're uh, able to look at the totality of all of the intersecting aspects of the uh, climate crisis. Would anyone like to talk about that and how important it is for us to just expand our vision and make sure all aspects of this gets funded? Happy to jump in on that, Senator. You know, you laid out a lot of the pieces that we're looking at here. We think this program can be expansive. Core members can complete a variety of projects in Massachusetts and across the country, things like coastal resilience, fighting wildfires, helping to restore parks, helping vulnerable communities become more resilient to the impacts of heat and storms. And I think that's what will prepare us both to tackle the climate crisis and to build the clean energy future that we need. So there are so many projects that are just waiting to be completed and with a robust level of funding from Congress, we can recruit members, put them to work, doing all of this work that's needed. Um, and can someone just answer this? Why is it important that young people support the creation of a national jobs program? Um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I think, I mean, coming from a youth organization, um, this past, what, 18 months, like almost 18 months, a year and a half, we've seen a lot of loss. And in addition to a pandemic where we saw so many people lose their lives um, and where like so much of the society that we know and how that operates fell apart, we also saw our fr friends and families like lose their jobs across so many sectors of work. And I know personally, um, I have a lot of friends who are either going into college or going into the workforce, and they genuinely have no idea how they're supposed to pay rent, find a job, buy groceries, and support themselves in this world that isn't prepared to support their later years of life. And so something like the CCC offers support in so many different areas. Not only is it giving you a job and a way to make a dignified wage, it's also a way for us as the next generation to build up the world that we're going to be living in and to really start this process of healing that we have to come back from because this is the world that we're going to become the stewards of. And without this kind of financial, um, structural, and 
support in so many different areas, we can't do that. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think we all agree that it's important that we recruit CCC members from diverse communities. Does anyone have any ideas as to how we could do that, just to make sure that 50% of all the slots uh, go to uh, communities that historically have been left behind? Yeah, I can speak from my recruiting experience. Um, I think, first of all, it doesn't start at recruiting. I think it starts with building a program that's really inclusive and safe and equitable. Um, and it starts with a staff team that's educated. It starts with a staff team that's maybe also from that local community. Um, you know, for this program, we sat down with a group of local high school students at a trade school, um, and we asked them what they wanted from a program like this. Um, what would you want from this experience? Uh, and we learn from that conversation and that's what we're trying to build into our program. And when we have that solid foundation, what they're really looking for, that's when we're gonna start recruiting from those communities. Um, so if you want your program to reflect your community, you have to invite those voices to the planning table um, long before you can start recruiting. No, that's great, great. And, and uh, for any of you, can you talk about your own local core programs and why it's important uh, to you uh, and why it can be used as a model uh, to be expanded uh, in your own communities, but also across the whole country uh, in this moment of intersecting crisis. Would anyone like to just take your own core and explain it and then how we could scale it up nationally? Absolutely. Um, I'll jump right in here. We've been doing uh, Groundwork Green Team since 2004 um, and started with a small group of six students um, who were being paid a stipend um, and quickly realized that um, hourly wages was the way to go and it needed to happen that way. And we were able to expand our program from six uh, to 10 for the school year. Um, and then as of Yesterday morning, we were employing 40 young people, 40 high school students here in the city of Lawrence and eight young adult leaders to lead them in this work um, and to pay them that minimum wage, right? And to make sure that they're getting what they need in terms of training and support to create, and you know, I'll go back to Becca's comment about this pipeline, to create this pipeline of young people as early as 14 years old, to be able to really care about what's happening in their world, to care about what's happening in their backyard, and to make sure that we, those of us who are in, in leadership roles now, are doing the mentoring and the conversations and the, the support that they're going to need to be able to take over, right, Senator? Because you and I are going to eventually retire from this work, but we want to make sure that our young people have what they need to make sure that they are, are picking up that mantle and doing it. So the the core of what Green Team does is really work on projects in the community that relate to the environment, that relate to community engagement, that relate to fresh food. Um, they do trail building and they go outside of the city to learn some of these skills and then bring them back to their to the community and to do the work here. The um, food that they're growing at the half acre farm that Groundwork Lawrence has, they're donating back to the community. It's not that it's food that we're selling, you know, we are donating this back. We are making sure that they are learning the value of service. They're learning the value of donation. They're learning the value of being a part of their community and being in service with each other. Beautiful, great answer. Um, so we're gonna take some questions from the press, but what I'd like to do is give each one of you one minute so that everyone who is on this live stream can hear why you think a civilian climate court is so important at this moment in time to our country and why it has to be put on President Biden's desk for his signature this year. So let me give each one of you one minute. I'll begin with you, Jasmine. Yeah, um, okay. So I think something that's really obvious whenever you start talking about these issues is that everything is so connected and all of these issues all of these systems and cycles of harm in our society right now are continuing to be perpetuated and continue to hurt our communities so i think that we need to take these big steps big bold steps that are very well funded by our government 
to really actively combat those systems of harm in all areas. Um, I know when I joined Sunrise, something that stood out a lot to me was the fact that we always use the word dignified. We call the jobs that we want to create dignified. And I think that that's really important because right now we need to really arm young people with a sense of dignity and with a sense of purpose as we move forward in creating a better world. Beautiful. Well said. Uh, Becca, can you give us your one minute? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, that was very well said, Jasmine. And I think this is this is our moment, both to tackle the climate crisis and to build a clean energy economy that works for everyone. And I think something that stands out to me is that both the people and the projects are there just waiting to be mobilized and put into action. So we have, you know, young people across the country, more than half of voters under 45 say that they would consider joining a civilian climate corps if it's created. And we have the projects, you know, from clearing forests so they're less of a wildfire risk, to retrofitting buildings, to installing clean energy projects, everything is ready. And it just takes the bold vision from government to put people to work and to begin to build the clean energy future. Fabulous. So excited to be here with this group. Fabulous, well said. Leslie. Uh, the excitement that I'm feeling right now, just being with these amazing people on this call um, and seeing some of the comments that are coming in. This is this is our time. This is it right now. And, you know, Jasmine and Becca have said it beautifully. This is the time to be bold. This is the time to stand up and take action. This is the time to arm our young people with the tools that they are going to need to make sure that we have a better tomorrow. And we, that is our job. We need to do this. This has to happen. We are these stewards that need to pass on that mantle and we need to make sure that our young people are ready for this. And this is the way to do it. This bold, innovative way of looking at how do we take care of tomorrow? And without our young people, that's not gonna happen, right? So let's move this forward. Fabulous. Um uh, Raphael. Yeah, um, Le uh, Leslie, Becca, Jasmine said it beautifully. It, it is true. We, we need to do it because it is so important, especially in the communities, to be knowledgeable, to know what's going on. Because a lot of times communities don't know what's really going on, what's really going on in the environment, what's going on around us, because they don't know or have the resources to do so. But with us, with the power that we can have, through the Senate and everything like that, we're able to push forward and educate and show that we can be a better tomorrow. Like Leslie said beautifully, we can be a better tomorrow. We can accept and bring in back in all these animals that beautifully were here before with all these green spaces. We can beautifully make a better tomorrow. And I feel like that's the best way to say it is that we need a better tomorrow. And I believe through this, we can have a better tomorrow. Fabulous. Uh, and uh, Nina. Yeah, um, the Student Conservation Association, this is what we're built for. This is what we already do, and we already do it really well. Um, we have core programs that are doing really amazing work in the conservation and preservation world. Um, and on top of that, career development is built into our programs. Um, we develop our curriculum knowing that our members are going to need a job when they're done with their service term. Um, so we bring in professionals. We give them the opportunity to train with, with tradespeople. Um, and, you know, on top of that also, like, you learn how to work on a team, you learn how to communicate with each other when things aren't going well, and then you learn how to celebrate when things do go really well. Um, so within our programs, maybe we're not creating those career full time jobs, but we are creating really amazing employees for those positions. So the Student Conservation Association is really excited for the opportunity to expand. Beautiful, beautiful job. And uh... My staff put together a zine on the uh, Civilian Climate Corps, which we can make available to uh, anyone who is interested. It's really a great uh, summary of all aspects of the, of the program and how it will be organized. 77% uh, uh, of the country supports it. Uh, it's getting strong editorial support all across uh, the country. Um, 
The Seattle Times says the Civilian Climate Corps would be a win-win for climate and equity. But uh, we lay out the component parts of it in our zine. So anyone who's interested, you can contact my office or Sunrise and they can uh, help you to get access to this uh, a, a, a physical copy of it or an online copy. Love, love to be able to just keep spreading the message. So uh, thank you all uh, so much for all of the great work you're already doing and we're going to do our absolute best to expand upon that and uh, make it possible for you to unleash this incredible energy in our country. Young people, especially who have risen up uh, and want to be a part of the solutions to this problem uh, that has been generationally ignored. Uh, and the Civilian Climate Corps has touched something uh, across our country this latent idealism and practicality uh, that we're going to need uh, in order to uh, solve this problem, but by enlisting hundreds of thousands of young people to be a part of it. So we thank uh, all of you for joining us today and I'll just stop right there. And if uh, the press has any questions, we'd love to take them. I have a question if I can go ahead. Hey, this is Miriam from WBUR. Um, some of my questions might be in that uh, zine that you mentioned, so I'll definitely try to get a copy of that. But I'm wondering from a logistical standpoint, how does this work? So do people get hired by the CCC and then get placed with a local organization? Do the local organizations recruit their own people and then they just get paid through the government? Are these year long projects? Are they open ended? Is there an opportunity for middle school and high school students to do a summer long program? Um, if you could just touch on some of that, that'd be helpful. Okay, well, I'll just lay out the broad strokes and then maybe um, uh, people from Evergreen or others could lay out the, the specific details, but we're going to use AmeriCorps as the umbrella organization. They already have more than a hundred of these programs across the country that are in existence, already operating, already in local communities. So we can use that model. We're not going to have to invent something new because AmeriCorps is already doing it. We're gonna obviously uh, expand the number of uh, projects uh, that they uh, can institute. Um, uh, the scope of this is gonna be much larger than anything they've ever done before. Uh, but uh, we're going to use the existing model and uh, because we know it works and and then um, uh, those AmeriCorps programs will uh, ultimately become known as the Civilian uh, Climate Corps, uh, but it's not going to be anything new. Uh, from Evergreen, would you like to jump in and explain, you know, how you see this thing becoming operational? Sure, thanks so much, Senator. And Miriam, I think the exciting thing is it's a combination of a lot of what you laid out. Um, so there's funding for a grant program that would go to cores like the ones on this call who already receive AmeriCorps funding to expand you know, the great work that they do in communities across the country. There's also money for federal cores like the Public Lands Corps and Jobs Corps that directly hire individuals throughout the country um, to, comp to complete projects. And all of these different programs and projects would be coordinated by a central hub um, that can make sure that the Civilian Climate Corps is unified, is tangible, um, is visible. And so it, it captures the benefits of programs across the country um, and unifies them towards, towards a singular goal. Excellent. Are there other questions? I can ask one more. Um, this would be for Senator Markey. What what do you see as being the biggest obstacle to getting something like this passed? Um, it would be um, the uh, the fossil fuel industry um, energizing their Republican uh, supporters in Congress just to uh, put up roadblocks to the passage. Uh, of our large uh, reconciliation bill that will include this as well as tax breaks for wind and solar and all electric vehicles and new transmission systems and a climate uh, bank uh, and so much more that is gonna be needed to deal 
uh, with the climate crisis that we are in. Uh, the Civilian Climate Corps will be a part of that bill, and uh, we're working very hard um, to uh, to work with Republicans on the bipartisan uh, legislation that they're interested in, but then following that, but on the same timetable so that they're passing simultaneously, uh, we need 50 Democratic votes uh, in order to uh, put that um, on the Senate floor and then have Kamala Harris break the tie on the $3.5 trillion jobs and, uh, and family infrastructure bill. So it's still a struggle. The Republicans won't want for the most part to be spending money uh, at that magnitude. They've already made it quite clear. Uh, it's just a continuation of the fact that the GOP now stands for gas and oil party. Um, so we're gonna have to come together as Democrats get the 50 votes of all Democratic members and then have Kamala Harris break the tie. That's our, that's our challenge. Uh, and uh, all I can tell you is that uh, Senator Schumer and President Biden are both committed to working hard with all Democrats to get the votes to accomplish that goal. Alrighty, Senator, I think you're good to wrap it up. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. This is an exciting, exciting program. Uh, and it is absolutely critical that we keep our energy levels high uh, so that we can put it on the books and then have hundreds of thousands of young people out there doing this work towards uh, not just having a job, but a career, because it's going to take a generation to remediate uh, what all previous generations have done uh, to God's great creation. So we need uh, we need to just keep working hard right here. It'll be jobs and justice uh, and, uh, and climate action at a historic level. And if we do it well, well uh, people will look back and say that was one of the greatest moments in American history. And all of you are already a part of it. And we're just going to try to bring in more allies to help you to finish the job. Thank you all so much, everybody. Thanks for all your great work.